everyone, thank you for joining us today uh, for the completion of our Best of QADS 2020 series. Today's presentation, Efficient Implementation and Use of AAPM TG142 by David Barbie. Before we get started, we do have a couple of logistic items to cover today. Uh, this, today's presentation is being recorded, so a link to the recorded webinar will be sent to all registrants as well as being made available on sunnuclear.com. All attendees are muted, so please enter your questions using the questions or the chat window, and we will answer those, as we will be allowing time at the end of today's presentation for some Q&A. If there are any questions that we're unable to get to um, or are not addressed directly in the presentation, we will go ahead and respond to those questions as well. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and pass the presentation over to today's presenter. David Barbie. Dr. Barbie is the Director of Radiation Oncology, Physics, and Clinical Associate Professor in the NYU Langone Health System, where he oversees all clinical physics operations in radiation oncology. That, uh, Dr. Barbie, it looks like we can see your screen, so we are all set. All right, great. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, so today I'll be speaking on efficient implementation and use of uh, AAPM TG142. Uh, you can see my uh, email address that is there, so if you have any questions and want to reach out to me directly, feel free to. Uh, and this presentation was given at the uh, QA uh, Dosimetry Symposium uh, back in February of this year. Um, so disclosures, uh, I did receive travel support to QADS back in February. Uh, nothing else to disclose. So first, I'd just like to give a, a quick overview of the NYU Lingo and Health System so that everyone's uh, on the same page of uh, what our system looks like. Uh, so we have three sites, uh, the main campus, the hospital there, where we have uh, uh, an edge, a true beam, a gamma knife, HDR, and CT sim. Uh, at our cancer center, which has got three true beams in the CT sim, and our newest cancer center in Brooklyn, which has a HDR, a true beam, and the CT simulator. Uh, so we have uh, 13 or 15 physicists uh, that cover all of these sites. Uh, and they're just, uh, and the, the, the hospital is uh, just about two blocks from the cancer center, so they're all uh, somewhat close. Um, so I just want to go over and refresh everyone on uh, AAPM TG142. Uh, so the NYU Linear Accelerator uh, Accelerator Program follows the recommendations of TG142, um, and it is uh, the, the QA uh, recommendations are spread over uh, six different tables there: the daily, monthly, dynamic wedge, MLC, annual, and imaging. Uh, each provides a uh, procedure and uh, a tolerance and baseline and also uh, the frequency. And uh, they're all dependent on whether or not uh, you're treating with an SBRT or non-SBRT machine. So overall, there's uh, 100 plus tasks over these six tables. Uh, so it's quite a bit to uh, manage and keep on top of. Uh, another point I wanted to make uh, from AAPM TG142 is the uh, tolerances and action levels, where they say that a uh, QA committee uh, should uh, set up these action levels. Um, so the first level, uh, level one, is the inspection action, and you're supposed to uh, develop this from Q uh, repeated QA procedures. Uh, the second is a scheduled action, um, and examples are uh, when there's consecutive results that are at or near a tolerance, uh, or if there's a, a clinical, uh, clinical impact that's insignificant over a few days. Uh, and the most critical, level three, is an immediate or stop treatment or corrective action. Um, and that's when uh, an example could be a non-functioning interlock or uh, an extreme dosimetric error. Uh, and it's very important to point out that the level one thresholds uh, cannot be specified by the QA committee. They have to evolve from QA data. So you really need a good way to go through all of your QA data to really kind of uh, uh, use that to build up what you want those tolerances to be uh, for those level ones. So now I'd just like to kind of go over what our uh, previous linear accelerator Q QA program was. Uh, so we utilized a combination of locally installed applications uh, with data that was being saved over different databases and network shares and local PCs. Uh, and you can see that we've got a, a whole, a wide variety of uh, applications that we were using for uh, imaging, dosimetry, and mechanicals reporting. Um, so there were just a lot of, lot of programs to manage and, uh, and have expertise in and know how to fix things. Uh, so some of the challenges that we had uh, with this QA program uh, were, were really standardization and oversight driven. Um, so the first one was using the correct version of the test, making sure that it, it, it had updated equipment in there, updated calibration factors, uh, tolerances, uh, analysis, device calibrations across computers and sites. Uh, because we had so many sites and so many machines and so many PCs, it was very, very hard to make sure that everything was up to date and we were using the correct versions. 
Uh, the next is uh, having numerous baselines and tolerances for each machine and technique and parameter. Uh, just being able to keep track of those and making sure they were up to date and correct. Uh, and then lack of automation and analysis. Uh, so uh, trying to figure out uh, a way that we could standardize analysis and make sure that the correct tolerances were being used. Uh, and then also manual transcription, where we were constantly just you know typing in numbers off of an electrometer or uh, or other device, uh, and because there was really no device integration that we had. Uh, and then data storage and access, where some of our data was being kept in in, in databases, uh, but most of it was uh, was in folder shares, uh, you know, in Excel documents or Word documents that was uh, insecure uh, uh, to being changed, uh, and it's very hard to get data out of those. Uh, and then report generation. So whenever we were inspected by the city or the state or uh, or ACR, uh, being able to generate reports on all of our QA program uh, is very tedious. Uh, and then also training and onboarding new staff you know, with the long list of programs that we have and, and uh, the nuances and expertise for each one of those. It's very difficult to have uh, new staff members come on board or new residents that we're training uh, and go through every single one of those. The focus quickly becomes learning the programs as opposed to the, the QA task that you're, you're trying to uh, test or build up expertise in. And then there's also the necessary IT upkeep and client software upgrades. With all of these uh, different pieces of software uh, across all these different computers, uh, every time we had an update or a version change on something, uh, we would need IT to go and push that out to all of those clients, which uh, was not always an immediate uh, event. Uh, and finally, it's the cost to maintain these multiple systems. Uh, because we have so many licenses uh, for these, uh, it, it becomes very, very uh, uh, prohibitively expensive. So with that in mind, um, we, we started to think to ourselves, what would an idealized machine QA system look like? Uh, well, ideally, you would have a single centralized platform that was easily accessible across all sites uh, where you would have locked results, uh, locked approvals, and also test versioning. Um, it'd be simple to, to update equipment and uh, standardize how QA was being performed. Uh, you'd also have automated analysis of all the performed tests, uh, uh, which would remove any variation in analysis uh, and enable you to provide multiple machine-specific test tolerances uh, and also automate data uploading uh, for processing. Uh, and finally, we were also hopeful that we could find a way to, to incorporate QA device integration uh, like we were doing with Atlas and uh, the Daily QA3 so that we could centralize calibrations and reduce those transcription errors and, and, and the need for uploading data. Um, it would also be nice to be able to have automatic readout of those devices and be able to compare them to a baseline, not just uh, get a readout and try to look up what the baseline is supposed to be for that test. So with that in mind, um, we, uh, we, we looked into SunCheck Machine, uh, which is uh, the spiritual successor to uh, Sun Nuclear Atlas. Uh, which was released as uh, originally as initially as SNC Machine in April 2014, which dealt primarily with the uh, the imaging tasks of TG142, um, and then SNC Routine uh, 2.0 was released then in April 2018, the first release of it, uh, which we uh, we signed on for and we started to implement clinically uh, that same month. Uh, that being said, the latest release is uh, 3.0.1, which was released around August uh, 2020. Um, and when I originally gave this webinar, uh, I think we were on version 2.2 in February. So if you see some slides that are different, it's, uh, it's from that initial webinar. I've tried to update wherever I can. Um, so it is a web-based system that's accessible from anywhere on your local area network. Um, and all the QA tasks uh, that are, that are uh, set up and, and uh, recorded are stored in a SQL uh, or Mongo database uh, with dashboards avail available for review and also scheduling. So on the right here, you can just see the uh, the machine work list, which is kind of the home page that you that we see, where we have uh, tasks that are due, those that are uh, pending review by a physicist, and then uh, those that are approved. Um, additionally, this is what the uh, what it looks like uh, on the page for uh, editing and running manually tasks, uh, where you can see that we have our uh, you know our daily and then some of our monthly tests in there, and you can see here that we've actually broken up our monthly tests, uh, separated them into mechanical imaging and dosimetry for each one. Um, and uh, the last point to make here is that uh, SNC Routine offers uh, SNC device connectivity with, uh, with some of their products, which I'll touch on uh, in a minute. Uh, so the first thing I want to discuss is, uh, is how we create these tests, um, uh, these test templates in uh, SNC Routine. 
So uh, on the right here is uh, with a, the splash page that looks like when you're trying to uh, implement a new test where you see that they have standard templates for a TG142 daily, monthly, and annual. Uh, but below that are all the, uh, the, uh, the templates that we've built out that, uh, that we've customized uh, to suit our needs. Uh, and, and you can see that, uh, that on the right side of that, there are just, uh, there are uh, uh, specific tasks that you can use. Uh, for each one of those. So if you want to build yours out, you can just uh, grab some of their, their templates, but you don't have to grab all of them. And you could choose the energies that you want to apply them to. Uh, so uh, there are pre-built tests, um, and it's easy to generate your own. Um, and the, uh, the tests are going to either be SNC device integrated or manual data entry, where you are transcribing uh, information yourself. Uh, and there's also an image analysis uh, in the imaging workspace. And one point to make is that uh, anytime you upgrade a SNC routine or, or your system, uh, be sure to check these tests and maybe just make a new one just to see if they've uh, uh, increased the number of parameters that they're testing uh, because they, they have built out and continue to improve uh, a lot of these tests. So in order to take advantage of it, uh, you should really make sure that you, you have the latest test version. Uh, so this is just an example of what our daily QA looks like um, in the setting baselines and tolerances workspace, the editing workspace. Uh, you can see on the left here, we've got our safety checks, our dosimetry that utilizes uh, daily QA3, um, our imaging tests, MLC weekly checks, uh, MPC just uh, checking off uh, that everything was completed, uh, and then any ancillary devices that we have. Uh, and so, I'm sorry. And so how it works is um, you connect your device um, up here, it's currently not connected. Uh, and then you just start a measurement and that becomes your baseline. And you can see here that you, your baseline can be set there and then you've got your, uh, your failures or your warning levels here for everything. Uh, this is what our uh, imaging daily registration tests look like where we uh, perform our six degree of freedom tests um, and based on what we see uh, on the, our TrueBeam consoles for our rotations and our translations, uh, we enter those here and you can see again, we have our, our expected baselines uh, and then our warning levels and our, our failure levels. Um, and lastly, this is a look at the imaging workspace uh, that they have where uh, we run our, our weekly picket fences here uh, scheduled on uh, one day of the week. Um, and these are performed on that one day and then they're automatically saved to a network share and then uh, SNC Routine picks them up and performs analysis. Uh, and you can see here that in this earlier version of SNC Routine, there's only uh, three parameters that they're really looking for. Uh, but in the most recent one, which we uh, haven't completely finished uh, implementing yet, uh, you can see that they've increased that now to 11 parameters, uh, going over many more uh, I parameters, uh, and they have uh, they've improved the display too to show uh, uh, what exactly uh, they're testing, and, and you can visualize the uh, the issues better. So it's just an example to make sure that you're updating your tests routinely. Uh, so overall, this has really improved our daily QA efficiency and quantitative results. Uh, things that we were just qualitatively looking at, like the uh, the uh, MLC QA. Now we have uh, uh, rigorous numbers that we can go go through and uh, you know check each specific leaf pair if we need to. And the therapists have been very, very um, uh, pro SNC routine uh, to the point that they're now rearranging some tests to try to improve their own efficiency uh, to get through uh, QA, morning QA, even faster. Uh, so now I want to talk about SNC device integration. So those that are familiar with Sun Nuclear products um, are, are familiar with this first part, uh, this, this, this first technique, where it's the local device measurement where you have a client PC uh, that's connected to the PDI host, uh, the power data interface, or the power data interface, and then uh, those are connected to uh, the SNC devices, uh, such as the daily QA3, the IC profiler, arc checker, map check. Uh, but this requires that all the applications uh, have uh, the array and dose calibrations uh, loaded and saved and accessed locally, uh, which becomes a problem when you try to scale out these devices to uh, multiple computers, because you have to find a way to make sure that they're all being managed correctly. Um, so SNC Routine does things slightly differently. Um, they now have this PDI host, which is kind of a virtual PDI. Um, and so that PDI host is what's actually uh, controlling the communication between uh, the PDI and the, uh, the, the centralized server. Uh, so basically, uh, from, a, from the client PC, you're interacting with a web page that's hosted on this SNC server. And when you send this, uh, the message to start or stop uh, uh, data acquisition, it actually goes uh, through the SNC uh, server to the PDI host, uh, which then controls the devices and collects the data. So it's a slightly different architecture uh, than, than what you're usually used to with, with uh, SNC devices. Um, and there are actually more devices coming. This latest version has uh, actually given uh, uh, support to the, uh, the arc check, 
uh, but it's a bit outside of the, that's more patient specific QA as opposed to a machine QA, which we're talking about. Um, so the next I want to discuss the, uh, the IC profiler in Quad Wedge is it's the device that's, uh, that's been supported since the start. Um, so what we see here are profiles for photons in the top row and electrons in the bottom row. Um, and I'm showing the primary axis here on the left where it's just the Y axis and then uh, these diagonal axes. So the, the quad wedge plates um, are, are, are copper and aluminum wedges for, uh, for photons and electrons respectively. Um, and they're just following first physics principles where there's an increasing amount of attenuating material as you move towards the outside of the device, uh, which creates these, uh, these slopes where normally they would be nice flat slopes like, uh, like they are in the unflattened, the, uh, uh, the non-wedged uh, primary axes. What you see in the diagonals, um, they're attenuated based on energy such that uh, the higher energies are uh, attenuated uh, less than the uh, lower energies, uh, which creates the, this kind of uh, slow, differing slope for each of the energies. Um, and in the electrons, which use the aluminum wedge, you can see it's uh, even more pronounced with the uh, six, uh, six E electrons, um, much, much sharper, sharper slope as they're attenuated by the aluminum plate. Um, so how do, these, uh, how do these profiles then relate to energy? Uh, well, it's done using something called the area ratio. So on the right here, you can see the, these primary axes where they have uh, this volume under the curve under these specified regions here. Um, and then they also look at the, uh, that, that same area under the curve um, for the diagonals that are underneath those, uh, those uh, quad wedges. And so they derive this area ratio by, looking, by taking the sum of the area for the diagonals uh, and take the quotient of the uh, sum under the primary axes. Um, and then they relate this area ratio to energy, uh, the D10 for photons, um, by multiplying it by a, a predetermined uh, slope uh, and, uh, and this offset term B, uh, which is defined by the user during calibration. And for electrons, uh, they found that there's a quadratic relationship between the area ratio and the R50 uh, of the electron beam. Um, and again, the C1 and C2 parameters are, are fixed. Um, and then the uh, C3 parameter is defined um, during uh, calibration. Um, and if you want to know more about how this uh, uh, energy ratio or uh, area ratio works relative to the energy, um, you can look through this uh, uh, variant technical bolt. And there's a white paper that Sun Nuclear and Varian put out on use of the, uh, the, the quad, uh, quad wedges and IC profiler during uh, machine commissioning. And I believe that uh, Varian has now moved all of their machine commissioning to using the IC profiler and quad wedge as opposed to the old bottle ship. Um, so we started this about three years ago, I'd say, um, uh, the, the previous webinar I gave, um, where we looked at the IC profiler and quad wedge and compared them to uh, a, a traditional ion chamber and water that we did. Um, so we did this for about 12 months, and uh, these are the results over the machines and energies that we tested. Um, and you could see on the left for photons here, um, the quad wedge plate uh, had a lot less variation and uh, a lot less bias in, in comparison to the farmer chamber. Uh, which was, uh, showed a little bit more variation. We saw uh, very low root mean squared error on the quad wedges, uh, an IC profiler of 0.08% uh, compared to 0.21% for the farmer chamber. Um, and in term, for the electrons, looking at the R50, uh, it was uh, even more pronounced, where we saw the, the variation, uh, the root mean squared error on the quad wedges of 0.13 millimeters uh, compared to the farmer chamber, which was uh, 0.62. Um, so overall, uh, the, the quad wedges are, are were shown to be uh, excellent devices for, for making sure that our energy constancy was, uh, was correctly being done. And we took a lot of the variation out of the setup from the farmer chamber and water, which was uh, responsible for the majority of the, the electron variation that we saw. Um, so this was great. It was very encouraging results. And uh, the next thing we said was, is there a way that we could use the IC profiler and quad wedge uh, for output constancy checks? Uh, and so we began to look into it. Uh, but uh, soon ran into issues uh, because in order to do so, we would need to be maintaining the dose, uh, the array, that, and the temperature and pressure calibrations for each of our three IC profilers um, across each of the machine's nine energies and across PCs. Uh, because in order to do this, um, uh, these energy checks uh, requires that you have energy and machine specific uh, uh, cali array calibrations and dose calibrations. Um, uh, additionally, uh, to do this with some of the, uh, the higher dose rate beams, like the triple Fs, you have to make sure that the gain settings are correct up here. Um, and you also have to make sure that for your quad wedge plate, each, each has its own uh, specific energy setting. Um, so there were just going to be a lot of parameters that you had to make sure were executed perfectly every single time you try to QA them, 
um, and across uh, the 13 physicists with varying levels of experience with the software and the QA uh, of, the, of the IC profiler, it was just going to be uh, uh, too challenging to implement. Uh, but thankfully, around this time is when uh, SNC Routine came out um, uh, to help us standardize the measurement. Um, so this is just uh, an example of monthly QA uh, using the IC profiler in Quad Wedge. Uh, and this is just a, a, a video sped up about four times uh, of what it looks like when you're actually collecting data. Um, so here, um, for these photons, you see that we're doing our primary uh, output uh, in this first row here. Uh, and then we're doing a secondary dose rate here. Uh, and then we're doing an EDW here, and, and not shown because we have to get the gating device out was uh, the gating device. So in these four measurements, we've we've done everything um, with really just one setup without having to move anything uh, except the uh, uh, switching over to the gating uh, gating application. And also at the same time, it's uh, it's measuring the D10 for this. So we're doing our energy check on the very first one uh, and beam profile constancy on that initial output check. Um, for electrons, it's very similar, uh, except that it's it's actually easier uh, because there's really only one measurement that you have to take because in that first measurement, you're doing your output, your beam profile constancy, uh, and also your R50 beam quality. Um, and it's important to note that the, the baselines that you have here can uh, easily be set during your annual QA after TG51 um, or after a machine service where, uh, where uh, resetting a baseline is warranted. Uh, that being said, for monthly QA, you can also do it uh, traditionally uh, using an ion chamber in water or solid water. Um, so here on the left, you can see the setup parameters where they're, they're listed out for you. And this is what it looks like in the execution screen, uh, not the setting up a template when you're actually uh, measuring, um, where you have your measurement depths, your SSD field size, uh, your chamber calibration factor, uh, and your TG51 factors, which are going to include your P-pole, P-ion, KQ, uh, and those factors, and then also uh, an electrometer factor and uh, the different dose rates that you should uh, uh, that you're testing here. And you can see it's got the usual uh, temperature pressure corrections and electrometer readings. Um, so this is still available um, if, if for, for users that want to continue to use uh, ion chambers. Um, and it's also got your baselines and tolerances that you can set there, uh, which will automatically update uh, as you measure, just like the IC profiler. Um, so, that being said, uh, once we started SNC routine uh, measurement with the IC profiler uh, and, and water tank, um, we decided to do a, a quick comparison. Um, so we took, uh, we were measuring both of them. Uh, we've been measuring both of them since we instituted uh, SNC routine, where we measure uh, in, in a water, 1D water tank using a farmer chamber and also with the IC profiler with quad wedges. And we've been doing this for uh, 20 months uh, in Sun SNC routine by a, a 15 physicist. So on the right is just uh, uh, an efficiency chart that uh, was generated by going through the SNC routine database uh, to get timestamps for each of the sessions. So you know if you are measuring uh, all of your photons, it'll get the, the first measurement, the last measurement, and we've calculated them out doing that. Uh, so this data was generated over uh, 100 plus uh, photon paired sessions and 70 uh, electron sessions. Um, and you can see uh, here we have the ion chamber in water on the left side and the IC profiler with quad wedges. Uh, so we estimate the device setup time uh, here, so about 20 minutes for uh, photons with the water tank and about two for electrons. Uh, and with IC profiler, it's really just uh, five minutes of putting the IC profiler on the uh, table and then around two minutes, which is an overestimate to, to swap out the, uh, the, uh, the quad wedge. Uh, and this bold area here, the measurement time, so this is really what's taking the timestamps from the database. Uh, and you can see that um, for photons, it was about 20 minutes on average uh, for ion chambers and water to measure all the photons, and about 10 minutes uh, uh, for photons using the IC profiler, including gating. Um, and for uh, electrons there, it was about 19 minutes um, to, for measurement, and we got that down to about four minutes on average um, using the IC profiler and quad wedge. Uh, and then there's also some breakdown time, but at the end of the day, we, we, we took a total time and we estimated it's about 71 minutes on average uh, to measure everything in water uh, and about 25 minutes uh, for the IC profile on quad wedges. So this reduced the time uh, by about half for photons and it reduced it down to about a third for electrons. And the total time was reduced to less than, uh, less than half of what it was uh, when doing everything in water. Uh, and it's very important to point out that the IC profiler measurements that we're taking are already being taken for flatness and symmetry and ed energy. So uh, it's really we're not we're not really adding anything. We've just completely eliminated the, the those 71 minutes um, for for output checks. So it really is just a huge time savings, and you're basically redoing a measurement that you were doing anyway. So 
uh, we were very, very encouraged with this. Uh, but the one question that we had, yes, it's more efficient, uh, but are we losing anything? Are we using, losing any QA fidelity? Um, so we then looked at output constancy. And on the left here, you can see that uh, it's a scatter plot of the uh, IC profile of quad wedges on the uh, Y axis and uh, ion chambers and water on the X axis here. Uh, and you can see this, this is over about 500 measurements uh, on all of our machines, uh, all of our energies. Uh, and you can see that they're all very well bounded uh, by 2%, which is our institutional uh, criteria uh, for, for immediate adjustment. And they're really bounded by 1.5%, um, which is what our, uh, our threshold is for, for uh, updating the, the dose calibration. Um, and looking over the entire data set, uh, you can see that the IC profiler on average, uh, it was about 0.3% hot plus or minus 0.6%, uh, which matched very well with the ion chamber of about 0.4% hot, uh, plus or minus 0.5%. For those values, we really just want them to be uh, as consistent as possible. Um, so the next thing we did was uh, we just histogrammed the difference of, of every of all the, uh, the matched points. Um, and I'm oh, sorry for not pointing out, but these were matched for, uh, for measurement sessions. So uh, immediately after doing an IC profiler uh, measurement, we would take an ion chamber and water measurement uh, and just then compare the, what the deviations are. Um, and so this histogram shows that uh, we're, we're biased at around 0.1%, so there's not really uh, any bias present, and it's got a standard deviation, uh, the, the distribution here, of about 0.7%, and it's, it's a fairly normal distribution as well, and an interquartile range of 0.78%. Uh, um, so the spread of this is, is much less than 1%, um, which is uh, you know, less than the 2% uh, uh, as specified by TG142 for output deviation. So uh, it is a sensitive technique. Um, for measuring output. Um, that being said, we also went back and looked at our uh, energy output constancy. Um, so this is looking at the, uh, the, the energy deviations across all of our machines uh, for these energies. Uh, and we're looking at the D10 uh, percentage change or the R50 depth change. And you can see again that the IC profile and quad wedge uh, are, are much, much tighter than the, uh, the ion chamber uh, in water. And uh, we repeated the, the, the root mean squared error calculation. And uh, again, we saw that the, uh, the IC profiler filer and quad wedge uh, were significantly lower than uh, ion chamber and water. All right, uh, moving on now, I just uh, want to touch briefly on mechanicals. Um, this is what the uh, mechanical QA pages look like uh, when we're actually performing QA. Uh, you can see that we've got our safety checks uh, incorporated in here, and then all of our uh, uh, collimator, crosshair, gantry, uh, couch rotations, and jaw tests all in here. Um, and we're able to define these baselines and tolerances uh, depending whether it's an SBRT machine or a non-SBRT machine. Um, and they provide real-time feedback of, of where they are, if they're passing, failing, or in that warning criteria. Uh, next, uh, I want to discuss our monthly uh, QA for imaging. Um, so this is, uh, so for in essence, your machine, um, it provides automated registration and, and analysis of your images. Uh, you can still perform a manual analysis in the imaging workspace uh, if you need to or if you want to. Um, but in that space, uh, you perform your, your baseline images set uh, in the template editing, uh, where you can determine the orientation of your image, uh, which slices need to be analyzed for CBCTs based on the key slices, uh, and also the location uh, and orientation of your ROIs for analysis. Um, and here you can set baselines and tolerances for each parameter. Uh, additionally, uh, automatic import can be set for, uh, for all of the images. Uh, you can do it either through uh, DICOM query retrieve from your oncology information system, which uh, in our case is ARIA, uh, but they also support Mosaic. Um, or you can do it through a file system monitor, uh, which is actually what we use, where we load up all of our uh, QA plans in machine QA mode on the TrueBeam, um, and it saves them to the, uh, the local variant iDrive. And we have uh, SNC machine monitoring that iDrive to pick them up. This way we don't clutter up our uh, OIS and have to constantly be recreating new test patients. Uh, I, it's something I definitely recommend doing. Um, and that auto match, auto match uh, in SNC machine is done uh, based on DICOM header information uh, for the, that baseline image that you've set. Uh, and it does that through the patient ID and then also the uh, image energy, the image current, uh, and the device serial number that generated the image. Uh, and so here you can see uh, kind of our, our, our task list in SNC machine for uh, all of the imaging sets that where we have all of our MLCs, uh, picket fence tests, our VMAT tests, imaging tests, and so on. Uh, and this is a look at the actual uh, QA plan that we load up on the TrueBeams for, for everything where we just run through them all. Uh, and this is a look at what the, uh, the actual image registration uh, looks like when you're setting things up or if you wanted to manually change something. 
uh, where it goes through each regions of the CAT fan. And these are the uh, uh, analysis uh, parameters for each of the, the CBCT, just as an example. Where you see here, you've got uh, your, your baseline values that you expect here, and then also a, a warning level and a, a failure level. Um, so now that, uh, now that we started implementing this in SNC machine, we wanted to kind of figure out what the best way uh, or, or what the tolerances and baselines should be. So we went back to TG142 to investigate and see what we should do. Um, and there we found that uh, for TG142, it really only gives uh, numeric values for uh, geometric parameters. Um, everything else is, is baseline. Um, so then we said, all right, let's look at uh, other literature. Maybe we can find a little bit more guidance there. Um, so we looked at TG-104, which deals with uh, the role of in-room KV and X-ray imaging for patient setup and target lo localization, uh, released the same year. Um, but similarly, they, uh, they only give numeric values for uh, geometric parameters and spatial resolution. Uh, everything else is baseline. Um, and they do have a, a, a pretty good uh, uh, quote here on the top here. Tolerances may change according to expectations, experience, and performance. Uh, which basically means that your mileage may vary and uh, is going to be kind of institution dependent. Uh, next, we looked at uh, TG-179, uh, which dealt with the QA for IGRT using CT-based technologies. Um, and that one really just gave numeric values for spatial resolution, uh, everything else at baseline. Um, and again, uh, uh, another quote here was that uh, uh, the appropriate test frequencies and accepted variability from baseline values uh, can only be ascertained after analysis of QA data acquired over extended periods of time. Um, so what all of these uh, task groups are really saying is that you have to go through your own data and, and start to uh, dig into what, what you think, what the data tells you the tolerances should be. Um, so that in mind, we, we then went towards the, uh, the vendors uh, because you know, obviously the vendors have to give you some sort of tolerance when you uh, receive a machine. Um, so we started looking at the, uh, the Varian uh, CBCT imaging uh, acceptance criteria. And so for, for those that don't know Varian, there are multiple available techniques, um, uh, each one with their own parameters. Um, so the idea here is that these are all the different imaging techniques that Varian has available on the left. Um, and then these are all the corrections that go on. And you can see here that some of the techniques share error normalization or HU calibrations, but others don't, um, such that if you're not testing some of them, you might not uh, be able to see changes in some of those techniques. Uh, so, but with that being said, variant CBCT acceptance testing only covers the head and pelvis techniques. Um, and so over here on the right is taken straight out of our, uh, our variant acceptance uh, manual, where you can see that for uniformity here, uh, it's only has for the, uh, the, the head and pelvis scans and the specification is plus or minus 30 HU. I'm just gonna ask you to, to remember that for, for the next slide or two. Um, and then also there's HU calibration, and we saw all those parameters that are in the CAT fan, and they only list out three that they're really checking against. Um, and for high contrast resolution, they only give uh, resolution levels for the head and pelvis scan. So um, what we did when we started out, uh, set out on our uh, improved image quality uh, initiative uh, for this year, uh, we retrospectively analyzed one year of CBCT data uh, from a single machine uh, for standard deviation of each technique and each parameter. Uh, our goal here was to define the machine-specific baselines and tolerances. Um, the baseline was going to be a prior annual, um, and our warning was going to be uh, two standard deviations and failure, three standard deviations. Um, but once we embarked on this and started doing the analysis, we discovered there were several key issues with our image quality uh, QA program uh, in how we were acquiring data in measurement, how we were analyzing data, uh, and also something with our software. Um, because uh, when we had done everything previously, all of our QA uh, was passed, it all looked good. Uh, and then once we started feeding that into SNC machine, um, we started to see that there were, that everything was not great. Uh, so here's an example on the right, this graph, uh, this is a scatter plot of all of our machines um, with CBCT HU uniformity for the head full technique, uh, which is one of the variant recommended, uh, where it gave that tolerance of plus or minus 30. And you can see that uh, in the preceding months when we started our initiative, we had several failures here, um, which we couldn't quite explain because uh, in our other QA analysis software, uh, they had all passed, they were all good. Um, so this made things made it extremely challenging to establish meaningful tolerances and uh, appropriate action levels. Uh, and the question that we're really trying to answer with all of this is, can we use a universal baseline or tolerance for our machines or are the baselines and tolerances gonna to be specific to each machine and even each technique? So that's really the question we're trying to answer here, but uh, we're already running into issues. Um, 
so to give an idea of why that head uniformity uh, is, is giving us problems, um, we started to, to do a deep dive into, uh, into what was going on there. So we found that CBCTs taken after uh, high dose scans uh, in rapid succession uh, would create this kind of uh, whole artifact along the center that you can see here in the top row uh, in the axial slice and then in a uh, uh, sagittal or coronal slice. Uh, you could see it going all the way through and you could see there is a drop in HU. Um, so we didn't observe this in our previous QA. Well, we did see these artifacts in our previous QA, um, but our previous QA analysis uh, uh, software did not uh, trigger an error on them, despite them being present. Um, and here you could see that uh, we, we found that uh, when you take them in rapid succession uh, here, we do a head CBCT, immediately take a pelvis CBCT. Everything still looks fine. It's within 30 HU. Uh, and then once we take a subsequent head CBCT, uh, we see that there's a drop and it's now out of tolerance. Uh, however, by waiting just about 10 minutes, uh, we can see that that's uh, now cleared up and it's back to being within tolerance. Um, so this work uh, has actually just been accepted for publication uh, by Samir Tanasia and, and Martha Malin. Um, and so for those that are interested in, in learning more about this artifact or uh, on our approach for uh, setting baselines and tolerances using uh, uh, SNC routine and other, other techniques, uh, we, we urge you to uh, go and check out that publication once it's uh, once it's, once it's out. Um, so part of the way that we drove some of this data was uh, we built ourselves uh, our own uh, dashboard for uh, uh, SNC routine and machine. Um, so here you can see that we, uh, we have a production and, and development environments. We can select our machines. Um, and then this is where everything is located, where we have uh, where all the tests are located, where we have the, the base template, uh, such as monthly imaging. And these parentheses uh, show how many child items are in there. Um, and so the next uh, underneath template is a hierarchy uh, where we're selecting, you know, what type is it Winston Lutz? Does it CBCT? So in this case, CBCT. And then finally, uh, and that shows how many child items are, are below that. And then finally, uh, for those four tasks underneath it, uh, it shows all the machines that are available with those. So this is just a, an idea of what all of our templates currently look like in our production system, where we have uh, uh, monthly dosimetry, imaging and mechanicals. And for instance, with imaging, this is what the hierarchies look like underneath that for, for each of the available uh, uh, tests within the monthly imaging template. Um, and when we go through those, uh, we set this up to help us uh, uh, visualize baselines across all of our machines, because the concern was that uh, for some tests, they might have wildly different uh, baselines. Uh, and so right now, the, these are being color coded so that if there's a very, very subtle slight difference of, uh, I think it's one standard deviation, uh, it triggers yellow within these uh, each one of these boxes across the machines, uh, and it triggers red if it's outside of uh, two standard deviations. And these are all very, very, very close, so it's going to be something like 0.01, but it, uh, if, if your standard deviation is zero, then it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to trigger. Um, and we can also look over uh, the specified date range here, six months to a year to whatever you want it to be, um, just to look at what the average value is for each one of the parameters in each one of these tests is, uh, which helps us kind of uh, identify outliers in some of the data that we're collecting. Uh, and it also provides a standard deviation. So if we want to use this to, uh, to help define our baselines and tolerances. Uh, so this dashboard has been, been very helpful in making sure that our entire program is standardized because we can go through uh, every single test and template that we have uh, to make sure that, that uh, the baselines are consistent uh, and that uh, there's no outliers in, in some of our average data. Um, and that being said, uh, since I presented that in, uh, in February of this year at QADS, uh, SNC in their latest version has come out with uh, data analytics, uh, where you see that uh, you, can, uh, you can specify if you want results or baselines, and you're able to uh, select some of those uh, tasks or, or templates uh, that you want to see, and you're able to print those out to uh, PDF or Excel. Uh, unfortunately, right now, it looks like uh, it's, it's combining all of the energies and, and things like that so that... Uh, it's going to average them out. Um, uh, so that's something else uh, that, that they'll probably have to give a little bit more granularity on so that you can look at a, a single energy uh, across machines, uh, similar to how I'm doing here in tasks. Um, so once we went through um, all of our data uh, to check out what was going on, we, we completely redid our QA program where we retrained everyone on how to acquire what we were doing to make sure our process was standardized. Uh, and then we made sure our uh, analysis software was, was all doing the same thing in SNC routine uh, as opposed to the previous version. Um, and uh, the, good, the good end of the story is that once we started doing that, um, we started to see improvements in all of our QA. 
uh, with the exception of last month, of course, as I was preparing for the webinar, uh, we had one that was near an outlier, but everything is still within tolerance. Um, and the other uh, big thing that we changed was we had previously been doing uh, the four most common CBCT techniques. We were measuring them every single month uh, because we had seen uh, instances where uh, one of the techniques would fall out. And if we didn't QA it routinely, we would see that, uh, that there was uh, image quality uh, artifacts and impacts on that technique. So that's why we, we QA our most common ones now on alternating months. All right, so uh, to close out, uh, I wanna to just touch briefly on annual QA. Um, so they are currently available uh, in SNC routine. However, uh, we're still in the process of implementing them. Um, you can see that they have mechanicals, uh, gating, MLC imaging, also in addition to the, uh, uh, the dosimetry tasks. Uh, and you can see that there's quite a few that you can use the IC profiler on as well, uh, which we're inclined to do. Um, and there's also some that you uh, can use this gantry mount on so that you can do your uh, photon electron constancy versus gantry angle. Uh, with the IC profiler as well. Uh, additionally, we're looking at some uh, some some novel uh, uses of the IC profiler uh, for things like uh, TMR or uh, or PDD tests for uh, TBI and also TSET. Um, and this is uh, just a quick look at what we're currently doing. Um, and we're doing this in our development system uh, to try to build out all the tests we want there first so that we don't uh, clutter up our production database. Uh, and I would highly recommend uh, to, to set up a, a, dev, a dev system to do a lot of your testing on uh, or set up a, a development machine so that you don't cl uh, clutter up your, your clinical data. And you can see here, this is where we did a lot of our baseline work as well. So if that's uh, currently being implemented at NYU, um, we're hopeful that as they increase the amount of devices that they support, uh, uh, we can start to use those for some of our annual as well. Uh, so in conclusion, SNC Routine offers a, a web-based platform that can be used to standardize daily, monthly, and annual linear accelerator QA. Um, it's, it's proven particularly beneficial for uh, multiple sites, machines, and physicists. Uh, and all of our data is now beautifully structured in a, in a database as opposed to being uh, scattered about in different, different locations and different uh, software. Uh, we spend less time acquiring structured data and now have automated analysis uh, using the appropriate technique and uh, machine-specific tolerances. Uh, SNC Routine offers flexibility with generating and maintaining templates, baselines, and tolerances. Um, and implementing SNC Routine has led to, uh, to improvements in both efficiency and quality of our LINAC program. Um, now, normally, when you, when you make something more efficient, you sometimes suffer uh, a loss in quality. Uh, but we found that uh, really implementing it has, has boosted both uh, with no detriment. Um, and finally, uh, SNC Routine uh, revealed issues with, uh, with certain aspects of our QA program uh, that we were previously unaware of. Uh, and through the use of the available automation and structured data, uh, we were able to improve, uh, improve those aspects of our QA program. Um, so I would just like to acknowledge uh, the hard work of the NYU machine QA team, uh, in particular, Samir Tanasia, Martha Malin, and Anthony Ray uh, for their, their work in uh, the uh, CBCT initiative improvements, um, and then all, all the other members of the team. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Barbie. We appreciate the presentation today. Uh, I want to remind everyone that's on the line, we are, all attendees are muted. So if you do have any questions, please go ahead and type those into the questions uh, area in the GoToWebinar application. Um, and I, I guess while we're, we're waiting for folks to do that, there were two questions that came in. Uh, one was, can you speak a little bit to the ease of reporting and how you correlate all your data now for your ACRs, et cetera, um, with respect to SimCheck? Um, yeah, absolutely. So because everything's in a database, um, SNC provides um, some structured reports um, that you can just go to the, uh, the, uh, the, the test template that you want to review. And uh, it's as simple as a button click where you, know, you hit the button and then uh, it's generating a PDF in the background and then uh, it just sends you the PDF. And so you have everything, you know, right there. So there's not really a compilation of lots of different things that you have to do. It's all done for you. That's part of the beauty of having everything nicely structured in a database. Thank you. Uh, another question is kind of thinking outside of, of the LINAC world a little bit uh, with other devices in your clinic. Have you set up SunCheck at all or SunCheck machines specifically for CT scanners or other devices as well? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is uh, specific to TG142 here, but um, yeah, outside of that, we, we have begun using it, uh, uh, testing it out and using it somewhat in our CT sims where we're scanning cat fans now uh, for monthly QA. 
Uh, and we're also building out uh, HDR and, and gamma knife tests, but those aren't clinical yet. Um, you know, a lot of it is is dependent on on the new features and some of the new uh, new things that are available in uh, you know in every upgrade. Um, so as those become you know as as the product becomes more fleshed out, then we're able to do more with it. And uh, uh, yeah, so we're we're currently implementing them. I guess is the the short answer. Yeah, no, that's that's completely acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question kind of came in about the PDI host and connectivity of the devices. Um, can you just explain a little bit about the workflow from a therapist standpoint and how that that what that looks like and as they're acquiring the data? Um, sure. So um, when PDI host is running in the background, um, it's just running in your tray there, um, but it is taking over um, all of the PDI communication. So uh, how it works in our clinic is we have a little icon that the, uh, the therapist will come in. If it's not already running, they know they have to click that and then it's sent down into the, into the tray in the background. And all they have to do is connect the device um, and then they go in and start to run their application or the, run the, the QA template. Um, and it should automatically collect background uh, when it detects the device. Um, if not, then you can just kind of hit a refresh button, um, which then usually finds it and it will automatically start collecting background again then. Um, and for the therapists, uh, they just, they, they moved to the very first test and uh, they basically hit start and then it automatically knows when the beam's turned off and they just hit advanced and it moves them right to the next one, uh, automatically analyzing everything as they go. So uh, it's it's it much much easier than than Atlas was for them or uh, you know other other daily QA platforms, and because they can do everything in one, they're not jumping around to different different forms. They, they basically just go right through the list and they're able to check everything off in the daily QA in one place. Wonderful. Thanks so much for the, the clarity on that. If there are any other questions, please go ahead and type those in now. Um, we do want to let everyone know that this is the conclusion of our Best of QADS series, where we've chosen six presentations that were held at QADS 12 in February of this year, uh, which sort of feels like a lifetime ago. But all of these presentations are available on sunnuclear.com. Uh, under the Best of QADS, you can watch any of these webinars on demand. In addition, uh, we do want to join us at your convenience to go ahead and check out our, our virtual booth. We, this is also on sunnuclear.com. We know that a lot of meetings and events have been um, moved to the virtual environment. Uh, you still have questions or want to hear latest and, and greatest presentations from experts at Sun Nuclear, and this is a great opportunity to explore that through our virtual booth platform. All right, with that, I do not see any other questions, so I want to thank everyone for your time. We really appreciate it today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thanks again, Dr. Barbie. Right, thank you.